Welcome to Shades of Diversity in Media. Um, we have a great panel for you guys tonight. Um, these people are equipped with so much knowledge. Um, so let me introduce them. First, we have Samir Guerrero. All right. Um, yes. Uh, Samir is Harlem bred and has always been using acting as an escape. Um, and he starred in Broadway shows like Philadelphia and uh, Let Me Listen. Mm. You can also find Samir on Power, as well as The Deuce, City on the Hill. And recently, um, he was featured in Netflix's new series, When They See Us. All right. So let's give it up for Samir Guerrero. <laughs> Next up, we have Margaret Kim of I Stand Media. Margaret Kim is a Peabody and multi award winning executive producer. Um, Kim is the founder and president of I Stand Media LLC and I Stand TV, a global multi platform network, um, content studio, and community hub. So let's give it up for Margaret. <laughs> And we also have Chandra B. Patterson. Now, Chandra hails from Virginia, um, and she's an honor graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University. In 2017, Chandra made her first television debut in Monsters Inside Me on Animal Planet. And she's also in the upcoming season of Power, the finale, alongside Lorenz Tate. And she's also worked with um, Van Peebles, Mario, yeah. Mar Mario <laughs> Van Peebles. Uh, so let's give it up for Chandra. <laughs> right. um, so we have a lot of great hot topics. So let's just jump on in um, with the number of in injustices happening right now on a daily basis in this country. Um, I think it's important to talk about race, right? Yeah. Um, and diversity. Why do you think that it was so important for you to be a part of the project when they see us? Why was that such an important role? To be honest with you, we can't stay silent about these type of situations. Like these are people's lives at hand. So I feel like me being part as an Afro Latino was my time to be a voice as well. You know, to speak about injustice. You know, we got Donald Trump that's running America that wanted them dead. You know, mm -hmm. something that they didn't do. So. Me being part of that, I really wanted to like encourage people to be part of stories that's untold, you know? That's awesome. why I chose it. That's great. Um, I also heard that there was a counselor on set. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. That, that's pretty heavy. That's heavy stuff. Yeah, um, because you're going, like, you're going back to right. that. Right. And you, people don't want to go back, you know? Right. People want to live in the now. So yeah, they had right. a counselor. And so what kind of things did you kind of do to decompress after such a... Oh, to be honest with you, I ate. <laughs> that's a great way to decompress. I, I eat, eat too. I, I think that's eat. a great way I to decompress. <laughs> I ate, I drank my tea, and I was good. That's great. I okay, good. listen, you have to have your things. And then plus, we were about to park anyway, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you just got to run around Central Park and. Not eat. really. We couldn't no. really. We couldn't really run around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. So to all of the panelists, um, does race ever come into play when you decide to commit to a project or a contract? Mm, I have to. S I don't really think so. No. Um, I think it depends on the project. You okay. know what they're looking for. Um, that's the only time I've really noticed it, but I don't see it as an issue, you know, as, as far as taking on a specific, a specific role. Okay. What about you, uh, Margaret? I mean, does, does race take... Does race, so when you're considering a contract or a mm -hmm. project, do you consider race at all um, when trying to decide whether to accept or deny or it's never come up in that way okay no, no. and what about you no nah, never mm -hmm. okay i think that's very interesting yeah. um i don't think it's in like a, a negative way it right. just depends on the project Whatever and the project what the is. what the needs are for for yeah. that project right. and um, everyone that puts on whether it's a tv show or a play they have something in mind um, when it comes to their specific projects. So it just calls for 
you know, uh, different things. Dif different things. Um, you know, I could be searching for a, a audition and um, you may see something where it says uh, white male, but they right. want someone that speaks German. You know, mm -hmm. it just it really depends on what what the the message that they're trying to get across in their project. Right. Yeah. OK. Um, now, let's flip that question and uh, apply it to the actors specifically. Okay. Um, do you only audition for roles that specifically ask for persons of color? Why or why not? No. 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 I don't. Because I'm trying to break diversity, really. OK. Personally, that's what I'm trying so to So you're do. trying to break barriers. OK. And what about you, Sean? Um, I, I don't. I'll still go to an, an audition because you never know um, how that person may see you. Mm -hmm. You know, they may be thinking about a role, uh, a particular person f for this role, and you may give them something to think about, if not for that role that you came in for, maybe for something else. And when you go in with that mindset, do you ever have the apprehension of, they might not pick me because I'm not exactly what they want. Of course, you got like this industry is about rejection. You got to take rejection. Okay. It's, like this city is really cutthroat. Do you ever feel like you've been rejected based on your color? Um, yeah, but you got to keep on going. What about you, Chandra? Um, no, I have to say no. Okay. All right. In the past ten years, um, what do you think has contributed to the rising presence of Asian Americans in the media? Uh, I think more, I think more Asians are just coming into the business. Um, you know, when we grow up, and there, there are stereotypes, and there are stereotypes for a reason for any mm -hmm. culture, right? And so I think, uh, you know, one of the stereotypes would be Asian Americans, when we're brought up by our families, our parents want us to be doctors, lawyers, and engineers. Okay. You know, it's something that is prestigious, that makes money, that's stable, um, and gives you a, a certain social standing. No one, they're not telling you to try to make it as an actor because that's so difficult. Right, right, right. Um, so, but in the last, I, I, you know, I'm seeing it more and more in the last three years, actually. Mm -hmm. um, more, more of us are coming into the business whether it's on the business side or on the creative side. And so I think even Crazy Rich Asians. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, it was a big, it, that was a big statement. It was. You know, it was well done, it mm -hmm. was fun, it had appeal. Um, and the Asian American audience also showed up. And we, um, I'm also one of the founders of this group called Asian Americans in Media. Okay. And we were part of the Gold Open meaning you know we there was a there was a movement to show up yeah you know the first weekend uh -huh. box office mm -hmm. and that you know that made a huge difference for that film i saw that on my facebook mm. everybody was just kind of like everybody needs to go see this movie i mean there was a huge push for that yeah. movie yeah. i went and saw it and it was a phenomenal movie it was really good yeah, but uh, i have to say i went to see it when i was in Houston in a preview screening mm -hmm. with the uh, Asian American Journalists Association during their convention. Mm -hmm. And so many of us, there were, there were several hundred of these Asian American journalists coming from all over the country for the convention. And we were all kind of like, I don't know, is this movie going to be good? Is it going to mm -hmm. be embarrassing? We're kind of cringing. It was amazing. And then we were pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm. You know. Great movie. If you have not seen it, make <laughs> sure you go out and check it out, okay? And read the um, book, too. Yeah, Crazy Rich Asian. It's amazing. Um, Chandra, yes. as a black woman, have you found it difficult to find roles that aren't stereotypical? Um, I have to say no. Okay. Um, I haven't found it dif difficult at all. Um, my manager, she puts me in for everything okay um whether it's commercial broadway um off broadway i have some work that i do on my end as well um student films uh, i just i don't necessarily see a limit now you see uh more things being advertised for black women uh, black males uh, more roles that we can 
you know, put in for and submit for. And it's just, it's opened up a lot within yeah. the past few, few years, which is a really good thing, you know, versus uh, maybe like 10 years from now, from 10 years ago, um, you really didn't see mm -hmm. that much. You had to look a certain way or be a certain size uh, if you were a black woman. Um, and now it's just opened up to, it, it can be anyone, you know. It can be any black woman. It doesn't matter her size. It doesn't matter her height. Does she fit the role? Does she deliver? And that's just what I see. I agree. That's great. Um, I want to ask all three of you, um, what exactly sparked your journey? What made you all decide, hey, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to dedicate myself to. And this is kind of my passion. So start with you. To be honest with you, I had to get out the house. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, was, I was growing up in, like, in a tough environment in the projects. And like as I go older, my mom kept me in the house just watching TV, watching TV. And then I fell in love with film and TV shows. And I was just always imitating. Oh. And then when finally, when it's time to go out, I'm, I wanted to be an actor. Not like exactly there. Like, I was saying, like, so you I just walked school, out the house and you and I, went to, <laughs> and I went to school first. And then when I got to college, and then I started learning like the, the steps on how to be an actor and stuff like that. The books you need, the training you need, being rejected. And then one of my favorite actors is um, Will Smith. So I wanted to be just like him. And initially, did you get the first role that you auditioned for? Oh, hell no. <laughs> okay, so you nah. just continued to audition. Yeah. And what was the feeling when you got your first role? My first role, I felt like I felt like I won the lottery. I would say that. That's amazing. What was Congrats. your first role? Oh, it was a student film. It was a student film. It, it was, was called Sunny Blues. Sunny it's on based on James Baldwin. James Baldwin. And was it paid? Uh, no, it wasn't paid. You got to okay. go from Okay, okay. I just want people to understand <laughs> that yeah. it's not a nah. glamorous nah, thing. You that's love this. <laughs> like, even if money didn't exist, you'll still do it. Right. And that's what you want to do. Wake up yeah. and do something that you love every day, yeah. right? All right. And yeah, Margaret? So my father was a journalist, and he traveled all over the world. He was a foreign correspondent for the Korea Times. And... Um, Everywhere he went, he would send each of us. I have two young, a younger brother and younger sister, and my mom. And he would send each of us a postcard. It wasn't like one postcard for the family. Mm -hmm. Like each one of us got a postcard. And I still have all those postcards. But the pictures on those postcards, you know, from Nigeria, from Thailand, from, you know, South America, it was just amazing. And I'm like, I want to go there. I want to mm -hmm. see that for myself. And, um, you know, as a family, we, storytelling was a big part of our growing up okay. and part of our, just even how we got punished. <laughs> we were punished, we were, we were spanked and then we were, we were given a story mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with a lesson at the end of it, you know. I so, my, you know, we grew up with story and, um, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, my, my dad being a print journalist, I really love television okay. and you know when I was growing up even though I was born here until I went to kindergarten I didn't speak a word of English so wow. I might as well have just come in from Korea because we only spoke Korean at home so when I started kindergarten I didn't speak a word of English and peop I know the kids being so nice as they are like giving me chinky eyes and calling me chink and Jap and whatever mm -hmm. they didn't even know what Korean was at the time mm -hmm. and um, I would just cry every single day. Mm. And how I ended up learning English was watching television. So I watched a lot of television. Wow. Mm. And so just kind of married the two things of s journalism, storytelling, broadcast. So that's how I um, started that's amazing. my career. That's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, um, I was not a theater major. Um, I was in my junior year of college and uh, one of the other young ladies that was in, um, I think it was like a religious class, she was a theater major and the professor gave her a compliment um, for a play that she was currently doing at the school. And um, I asked her questions and my mom tried to get me in acting, you know, when I was smaller and everything. 
And um, she said, well, you know, you can audition uh, for the place for the, the year as a student as long as you're, you know, a student. I said, oh, I thought you had to be a theater major. She said, no, you don't. So the following semester, I decided I was just going to, I was just going to audition. And I went in to audition, and I remember doing the uh, uh, August Wilson piece. And I said, thank you, and I proceeded to leave because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. And everybody said, no, wait a minute, wait, wait, but where are you going, where are you going? You know, they was like asking questions and stuff like that. And I found out later on from someone that was in the room, they said they had a conversation about you. And they wanted to know where had you been this whole time? Wow. Like, why weren't you a theater major? And I said, you know what, I actually had thought about being a theater major, but I kind of sort of got sidetracked uh, when I told a relative, you know, I'm thinking about majoring in theater. And their response was, well, you know, you can't really find a stable job after you mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. And I thought about it and I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. Yeah. So that's what led me to not do it. Right. And I ended up getting called back from the professors, one professor in particular. Um, he was the only black professor at, at the university, at VCU. And um, he called us in, a few of us in for a role. And it was down to me and another young lady who was not a theater major either. She was a mass communications major. And uh, we asked him, we said, well, why did you just narrow it down to the two of us when you know you have theater majors and his response was they did not deserve it mm. wow and the other young lady ended up getting the role and us and i you know saw the play but that's what really sparked the interest of i may be on to something so i need to pursue it and i auditioned for my first play Henrico uh, Theater in Henrico, Virginia. And I end up getting the role the first time around. That's great. Oh, that's an amazing story. And you've never done acting before? I, had, I, I mean, I had did like little itty bitty stuff here and there, but nothing, nothing serious. serious yeah. Nothing serious. But I, from just that experience being in college, I knew that I said, okay, I may be on to something mm -hmm. and I need to pursue, pursue it. it. Because if I'm not really in school and training for it, and I just have a knack for it, then that's something that I need to venture into. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man, people are always limit you yeah. by what they can see. Yeah, but your 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 paths are different, you know. Um, all right, so now we're gonna have our question and answer portion. So we're gonna get some. Uh, audience participation going, right? Are we excited? <laughs> All right, so um, does anyone have a question for any of our panelists or myself? Um, if you do, please make your way to the microphone right here. Amazing, thank you. Uh, and what's your name? Uh, my name's June. June, nice to meet you, June. June. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we met at a different dinner. Yeah. Oh, so, that's so, great. Uh, yeah, I just had a kind of question. So I guess this kind of pertains to Margaret, but uh, everyone as well. So, you know, what do you think, sh you know, writing and shows are kind of going to be like for the next generation? Like, you know, when the Gen Zs get older or even now, like what kind of trends do you see happening with the type of shows that are going on? That's interesting. That's <laughs> what kind of shows do you see? Um, I'm not sure what shows I necessarily see, but it would be nice to see more Asians, more Native Americans, mm, um, more um, people who are from the, the Mideast. Mm -hmm. um, we see the rise of blacks and mm -hmm. Hispanics. But it just would be nice to see everyone Stories. on a screen or on a stage. That's what I'm waiting for. True. I agree with you. Yeah. 
I don't know if what we can. I don't know what we can expect, but what I would like to see um, is stories that are written well, mm -hmm. stories that are coming from different perspectives, that are more complex, um, that make us think. And I'm not. I'm not so interested in the bubblegum stuff. Honestly, I mean, I, you know, I got into the business because I really, I mean, from, I, I think I was just kind of innately born with this understanding of how powerful media actually is. Mm -hmm. And you can use that, uh, that tool to tear down or to build up. Right. And I've always had the, you know, just the core of my being, like, it's, there's so much power in media and we are the bullhorn for culture and for society. And we can use that bullhorn to tear down or to lift up. And I, I, my goal is to lift up and to edify through the stories that we tell. And, you know, I get, you, you know, a lot of the stories that we see today, it's like it's reflecting a reality. Um, but I don't know that reflecting the current reality or some version of reality is always the best thing. Mm -hmm. I would rather see the reality that we want something to become you know we want this better right. society we want this better um, relationships we want you know we want to see reconciliation we want to see um, people coming together we want to see forgiveness for for hurts and wrongs um, that's what i would prefer to that we aspire to instead of just rehashing the pain you know, mm -hmm. how do we overcome the pain? How do we overcome the anger? How do we overcome challenges? What about you, Samir? Um, I want to see a movie about like our black pharaohs, like take it back. Yeah, that's history, great. You know, we, ha we haven't seen that. True, I agree. That's, that's great. I heard that um, Ryan Coogler mm -hmm. and Michael B. Jordan are working yeah. on something. Um, okay, that's amazing. Anybody else have any questions? All right, come on up. All right. You brave soul. <laughs> and what's your name? Uh, Delenia. Delenia. Yeah. Hi, Delenia. Hello. Um, my question is, uh, being that I was watching uh, a documentary with Jim Carrey, how he became Andy Hoffman. So this is kind of... I seen himself like he was kind of losing it mm -hmm. a little bit. Like, mm -hmm. do you guys ever like feel like you're losing, losing yourself it? in a role, and or even preparing in the role? You you gotta lose yourself. Dang. You have to. It's deep. You have to lose yourself because you gotta sacrifice like family, friend, just to get in, into that role. And then after the, the movie is done, you back to yourself. Not all the time. You like you know some people need therapy, but it's all moderation. Um, I find that you may find some similarities uh, with your per personality or your walk with the character that you're playing. Uh, so sometimes you can take uh, a bit of yourself into a role and you know there are some things that you do have to leave behind so that you're not judging the character that you're playing. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that therapy therapy is mm -hmm. just always help, healthy. Yeah. I mean I mean a therapist or a really good friend, <laughs> yeah. and free the free ninety nine. The free ninety nine is the best, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> um, but always having just a sounding board, I think, yeah. is is very vital. Yeah, you need. I people. mean, in life, you know yeah. what I mean. I mean, aside from whatever your career is, um, but in life, and I, I also think that even in acting, because you do have to lose yourself mm -hmm. in those roles. Sometimes you, you might need to find yourself too. So <laughs> you <laughs> might want to have somebody to talk to to redirect you back to self, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm just a comedian now. Exactly. Delania, you get it, girl. <laughs> All right. Um, so my next question is, what specific obstacles um, did you encounter to get to this moment in your careers? Um, you know what? I've been starting with you the whole time, so man. Oh, I'm gonna start with somebody else. Uh, Sandra. Uh, obstacles. I would have to say, getting out of your head. 
That's good. Mm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Getting out of your head is, I mean, that is so That's the first step. important. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I find myself now having to create a daily calendar so I know the things that I need to do so that I'm not missing anything as it relates to my you know, career, mm -hmm. but keeping everything in my head, that just doesn't work for me. <laughs> so for me, that's one, that's one obstacle. And then not rushing the process because you could see something and you're like, oh, I could have did that. You know, like what happened? I, I wish I was in that project. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, calm down. You have to talk to yourself and it's coming. Mm -hmm. You put yourself out there, casting directors, they see you, you get put in front of the same casting director, they see that you're determined, and they learn you, and they know what you're good for. Mm -hmm. So just taking your time and not rushing the process. Margaret? Yeah. Um, I think one of the obstacles that I faced in my career, I was an executive at a network. Um, in programming and um, had, had been very, very successful, delivered hit series, gotten multiple, you know, awards and, you know, just if you looked at um, my success along with my colleagues, I was Hey, really, you was a top I, girl. I, Look yeah, at I don't, you. Not to. You go, to <laughs> but, your own girl. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was doing really, really well. <laughs> And I went into my boss, and I went into him, and I and I love my boss at the time, and, and we're still friends, and I consider him a mentor. But at the time, he said, to, uh, you know, I said, you know, I would like to get uh, a promotion and a raise because of X Y Z that I have accomplished, and you know, I laid it all out, and he said no, mm -mm. and. Uh, you know, his answer was not a, it was kind of a, come on. Bogus. Yeah, it was kind of a bogus answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was really, really frustrated. And I learned from that situation, um, I observed a, couple, a few things. Now, if I had been with the success that I had, if I came in a different package, if I didn't come in this shade and in this gender, and, and I wasn't 5'4", I was 6'2", white guy. Um, I, I do think that you could not, you know, you could not have denied me. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt, you know, I, I don't tend to default to a racist mindset, like mm -hmm. I'm, as a victim of racism mindset, right, that's, right, not right. My, that's not my default setting. Um, but I do think that had some, you know, it, if it that were the situation, time time. that mm -hmm. would have been mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. um, but I also learned uh, leadership from that scenario because, you know, my, my boss at the time, again, I had tremendous amount of love and respect for him. But one of the things that he did uh, that hurt him in his own career was that he did not... I mean, he was, he was of a different generation, so he was a boomer. Okay. And, you know, just kind of keeps, keeps your head down and just humble, just don't, don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't boast about yourself. Don't ruffle any Don't boast about yourself mm -hmm. and just be quiet. But he was leading a team, and with the team, you have to celebrate the team. You also have to celebrate the wins of the team and the individual wins that from among the team and then you have to promote your people mm -hmm. in order to also solidify your own position mm -hmm. because what ended up happening was there was politics happening at the time and he ended up getting pushed out and then that that left the the entire staff um, vulnerable right mm -hmm. and so what I w when I watched that happen I was like okay you know, in order for us to be good leaders, it's not about just self, it's not about a self-promotion. 
which I never thought that it was, but I saw it in a totally different way mm -hmm. in this scenario. It's not about self-promotion. Leadership is about how we raise up others around us. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we, how do, we do that? And, and doing that, um, doing that well. Very true. Yeah. So, man. Treat everyone nice. You don't never know who's gonna be in power. Yeah, that's you never know. Choice. You never know, and it's who, it's who you know. It's really who you know. That is very true. Yeah. And who knows you? Definitely. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true too. Okay. Um, there was a honey. Uh, you guys ever watch Honeymooners? The old old show mm -hmm. with Ralph Crand, and he had a he had a um, line. It's like, "Be nice to the people on the way up." Because they're the same people you're going to meet on the way, on the way down. down. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, have you all ever had moments when you were ready to give up, and how did you handle it? Oh, yeah. Um, when I was about to go on an audition, Metro card went up to 275. I was like, no, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. You I didn't did. jump the turnstile? <laughs> I did, I did. Oh, you jumped it? <laughs> we I won't tell to. them. We won't. It's, a, it's a secret. I could cut that out, right? <laughs> What about you, Margaret? Uh, giving up. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've been more on, on an entrepreneurial journey right. over the last five years. Which so is tough, though. It's yeah. very tough. And have there been moments where I've been like, oh, my God, why am I doing yeah. this? What? Let me just go back to a nine to five job yeah. and just <sighs> collect the paycheck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have those fleeting moments mm -hmm. of having that thought. but. You know, at the end of the day, I'm like, no, this is, uh, I, I am called to do something else. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to, uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you're an innovator and you're a visionary, you have to, you have to be persistent. You have to so believe in it mm -hmm. to be persistent because it's easy to give up. That's true. It's very easy to give up. What about you, Sean? Um, I always try to remember that the next time could be that very moment That's where you receive you your breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to, you don't want to give up. I think the young lady that played, what was it, uh, the Wonder Woman movie? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gal, Gal Gadot? She almost literally was like, I'm... I'm not doing this mm -hmm. anymore because I don't fit any roles. She kept auditioning and kept auditioning and she was like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. And she got a phone call that says, I need you to go to this audition. And she went in with the expectation of, I probably won't get it. And she ended up getting it. And you just, you, you never really know. Like uh, the, I just filmed for, you know, power. Um, the day that I was called to go to the audition, um, I actually told my manager no because I had something going on. And um, she said, I'm telling you, did you, did you read the breakdown that I sent you? Um, did you see that it was, uh, that it actually is a major role and how much you're going to get paid? And I was like, no, I didn't look at it. I looked at the date. I looked mm. at the time, mm. and I got something else <laughs> going on. I won't be able to do it. And she was like, Chandra, I am telling you, you need to be at the audition. And this wasn't the first time that I had auditioned for Power and had been in front of the same casting director. Mm. And I uh, looked at everything, and she said, you're going to get paid this this amount of money, blah, blah. I said, I'm going to get paid how much? <laughs> I said, oh, I'll do it. She was like, well, I thought you said no, never mind. Mm -hmm, yeah, I can, d don't worry about that. Rearrange stuff. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> yes, I'll do it. And um, I went in for the audition, and I did something at the audition that I had just did at a Law & Order audition. I went to my Law & Order audition, and I g got in front of the director, and I hit the line the, f the first time. And the director said, oh, I guess we don't have to do this again. So when I went in for my power audition, I said, well, I guess we're on a roll. I'm not going to do this line a second time. I'm going to do it the first time. We're going to do it right, mm -hmm. and we're going to get up out of there. And I, I auditioned for three roles. She gave me one of the roles, but I hit each line the first time around. And she looked at me and she was like, oh, okay. 
Well, I guess we don't have to do it again. I said, okay, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, thank you for coming in. I said, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> and I left. And I actually thought I didn't get the role because film and TV moved so fast as far as the casting, but mm -hmm. I didn't give it the full three days, you know, at least. And I got a phone call the third day that says, you know when I told you to go in for that audition? Well, congratulations, you got one of the roles that you auditioned for. That's amazing, that's amazing. So you just never know. Yeah, congratulations, that's great. Um, all right, so it's time for question and answers. Oh, aren't we excited about that? Uh, do I have anybody in the audience that might have a question? I do, come on up. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. What's your name? My name's Marvin. Marvin, nice to meet you, Marvin. It's good to meet you too. Um, hi. 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 Uh, so, you know, nowadays we're having like all these different service, um, streaming services for shows, like Disney's coming in with their own. And then we always have Hulu and Netflix, who's like, I guess the bread and butter of, the, uh, of that industry. And sometimes I wonder, like, if you guys think that it, Stream services will start allowing, it, well, sorry, uh, through streaming services, a lot more, um, I guess, directors, producers get to like introduce shows, like this gives them more freedom to do what they want, mm -hmm. or do you feel like there's some, some apprehension about it because you feel like at, at some point, the same rules that like, that governs television for the most part for the past few decades will start seeping their way through and start doing like mm -hmm. the same story in, in that front. No, me personally, I don't discriminate. I do television, Broadway, you do web it all. series. I do it all. Okay. But do you think that the streaming services... No, I feel like it reaches audience faster. Okay. And do you think that they'll be taking on more, I mean, different producers and, you know, it'll open up bigger doors as far as... I think it's already as, happening. Yeah. I think it's already happening. Mm -hmm. In terms of, you asked about restrictions. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I just, I just binge-watched um, this week Designated Survivor, mm -hmm. which is originally on ABC and now it's on Netflix. Was it good? Um, is that something I need to tune into? I, you know, I really like the first season. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good, it's good. Um, and, and I definitely saw a massive difference. And there were more expletives um, in the Netflix version and more just yucky A little language. bit more raw? Yeah, it was, but I didn't like it. Okay. I felt like it, it I mean, because it was a complete... Dif a complete I mean, difference. A complete difference. Between what's on TV. Right, was between when it was on ABC to then it was on Netflix. And I felt like it was... The language it was well you know um, it was unnecessary well yeah abc is you know family oriented as right, opposed of to netflix that yeah. i mean i don't i wouldn't say they don't have an audience but i mean they have a broader audience you know yeah so. i just didn't like the i didn't i didn't like the language <laughs> <laughs> i was like it's not necessary to go down that road yeah. <laughs> i understand that what about you Chandra? um i'm not really i'm not really sure um between streaming and TV, anything is possible. Uh, what Disney is about to take over. I'm really excited. They're letting everything they're, they're out of the vault. They're taking over what, Net Netflix? No, they're gonna or come out Hulu. with their own streaming yeah. service. Oh, they're, oh okay. Plus. So it's, I don't know, maybe if it gets bigger and bigger and they see the need for more regulations and, and control possibly, but I'm, I, don't, I don't know. See, my biggest issue is that you know, all these streaming services, it's about to be my, it's about to be as big as a cable bill. You yeah. know what I mean? If I pay Netflix 10, Hulu 10, yeah. Disney 10, <laughs> we at 30. You know what I mean? Uh, exa exactly, yeah. especially if you do it without the ads. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's my issue. But I definitely think that um, the streaming services are allowing more producers and writers to come on, yeah. but it's basically a pit a pitch type of style. Mm -hmm. So basically you film your stuff, you write your stuff, you you get it all together, you edit it, and then you're able to go in and pitch. And if they like your story, they'll buy the story. So I think that opens up a lot of doors for producers and directors. Um, we have another question. All right, come on up. Yay. 
Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. What's your name? Eric. Eric. All right. Um, Hi, Eric. So I just want to touch a little bit about what you're saying about Netflix, right? And, mm -hmm. and streaming and opening doors. And it's kind of what Ms. Kim said, right, about what you would like to see in the media. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been watching a lot of Netflix, but I've been watching kind of like the detail of it. And I noticed that is they are promoting kind of those things. You know, we had like Black Mirror, and oh, they sh yeah. they're showing on. Um, um, homosexuals, you know, like on TV, mm -hmm. live on TV. They show now um, um, when they see us, which is a lot of people of color, more on TV mm -hmm. and directors and stuff. So I think in due time, we'll get there um, in just some time. Mm -hmm. well, my question is, um, has your role ever made you feel like you made an impact? Like that make that make you keep going? Like, yeah. oh, I'm really making a change, a change or I'm really making an impact, you know, maybe people that, that look like you, you know, maybe your neighborhood, the community. Um, do you ever feel like you make an impact? Do you feel like you make an impact? Do you feel like you have a responsibility to your your people, in a sense, when, it, when you take a role? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to take on just any role just for the sake of saying, you know, I, I have something for a real or, um, to compromise myself, but whether people realize it or not, whether you do music or you do TV and film, you are a role model. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a group of people who uh, are attracted to you, mm -hmm. whether you sign up for it or not, and they look up to you. And I personally don't wanna just put anything out there just because. Mm -hmm. Um, I always want to have a strong message um, and be in a position to help someone else. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I've, I've been wor working more on the nonfiction documentary and news side of the business and, you know, take that responsibility really seriously. And so some of the things that we're seeing in the um, media today, I, it really kind of grieves me because, you know, if, I think people have forgotten what it means to be a journalist. Yeah. Everybody is so um, about the commentary mm -hmm. and then about mm -hmm. their own opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's not journalism. Mm -hmm. That's commentary. That's, that's editorializing. And there's a place for that and right. there's a need for that as well. But a journalist's job is to, you know, provide context to a story, to to lay mm -hmm. out and in a balanced manner mm -hmm. and letting the viewer decide, not, mm -hmm. you know, a journalist, y you should not ever know whether a journalist is a Republican or a Democrat, mm -hmm. a liberal or a conservative. Mm -hmm. you, should tr you should be able to trust the journalist that they are mm -hmm. looking for the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. That's their goal, is to pursue the truth. And so my, throughout my career and, and in the things that I'm doing net to this day, it's been with that mindset. That's great. Me personally, I try to get roles that's really going to shift the culture. You know? And by the culture, you mean? The, like the culture that we see today. The culture. You know, so called like um, white, black, like I want us all unite, you know? Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Um, okay. So, anybody else have another question? Do I have any more questions? Oh, look at you guys. Eager. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to take her first, then I'm going to get you. I'm loving this. Oh. Hi. Hi. How are you? Um, my name is Deja. Um, Hi, Deja. I want to ask a question for like people that's like just dipping their toes in the water for like media. Mm -hmm. My question is like, what do you think is the best possible way for us to like get out there? Because like as a person that's just starting, it's like scary to like try new things, especially with the new generation. Like we're always like scared to like speak to people and stuff. What do you think is like the best possible way for us to like get out there? Ownership. What I mean by that, all right, right now this so much millennials. You get together, right? And you make, let's say, one person popping or, or famous. That person right there is gonna get famous. Why? Because that person has a fan base. And what I've noticed um, working behind cameras, working behind cameras, I don't see a lot of people working together. That's the downfall. 
So uh, for your, uh, for my answer is to you, like, just worry about yourself. Be your own producer. Be your own director. Be your own writer. And people are going to come to you. Okay. Margaret? You want to go first? No song? <laughs> um, I would just say just, just do it. Like, if you have an idea, just go for it and put it out there and see what the response is. Mm -hmm. And anything that needs to be tweaked, tweak it. Mm -hmm. But you have to get past that shyness or that fear and just don't even think about it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say come to the Future Now Media and Entertainment <laughs> Conference, <laughs> which happened a couple of weeks ago. This is, uh, I, I'm also uh, the founder of a foundation called the Future Now Media Foundation. And it's a leadership incubator for college age students who are aspiring to have careers in the media and entertainment space. And so the conference is built around bringing together the, the students with today's top executives and media professionals, um, uh, folks in the industry to learn from them, um, be mentored by them. And so um, there are opportunities like that and organizations like that. It kind of depends on what your, what your interests are. But I would say do research because there are organizations like mine and others if you want to pursue acting for young people um, that have resources, that have community where you can start to really build your professional network and really hone whatever craft that you're interested in pursuing. So do, do your research because there are organizations out there and certainly MNN mm -hmm. here what a great facility and educational program they provide so and Rome was not built in a day yeah. you know you're not necessarily just gonna walk in and be the successful person uh, uh, comedy take has taken me on a crazy journey um, but like Chandra said just have to do it right um, Issa Rae has a really great quote where she says um, work horizontally, like we're constantly trying to reach for the person above us, right? We want to work with, I don't know, you say you want to work with I don't know, Quentin Tarantino or something, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're constantly reaching here, but you have all of these great people right next to you. Like we're in a room full of creatives. You have these great, uh, June, June is sitting right next to you, right? So you could easily just turn to June and say, hey June, what do you do? Oh, I direct, oh cool, I write. Let's link on a Saturday for coffee, right? Get off your phones, young people. You know, y'all just want to tweet everybody, but you gotta gotta talk to each other. You know yeah. what I mean? You gotta talk, have conversations, and that's kind of how those relationships kind of build. Um, all right, I have one more question, and we are rounding this up. We're, we're coming, we're coming into the end of this thing. It's been such a great conversation. Um, you have a question? Awesome. Hi, what's your name? My name is Seth, nice to meet you. Seth, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming out. I'm glad I have the last question. <laughs> so, I'm 23 years old and I have always worked two, three jobs to support myself Listen. and, you know, and do media on the side and sometimes, you know, I get really down on myself because like you said, you know, you want to see the progress but you're like stuck in the ditches. Mm -hmm. So, I wanted to hear about, um, y'all's life in the 20s like what were y'all doing in the Tough. when you were my age and <laughs> like I just want to hear like a real story because okay. now you're accomplished professionals but you weren't that Barely. to begin with so I want to know how you got there and mm -hmm. what giant shoulders did you stand on to get where you are today Seth, I'm barely there. I'm just going to tell you now. <laughs> um, I'm still working eight jobs. But, yeah. um, <laughs> so here, okay. I'm going to say nobody's perfect. You know, I'm going to be honest. In my 20s, I was partying a lot. <laughs> partying a lot. I, was, I missed out on a couple of audition and roles. Mm. But now I'm back on my feet. So for you, is just change your circle around. People, that, You got to be around people that's going to motivate you, that's going to pray for you. And... From right there, I think good things will happen. Mm -hmm. Good things will happen. But don't quit your job, trust me. <laughs> some bills won't quit on you. They, they don't. They won't. They I won't. agree. Margaret? Um, so I got my first job at ABC News, and it was as a desk assistant, which was the entry-level job at ABC News. 
and I was on the graveyard shift, meaning I was working midnight to 8, 9, 10 in the morning. And um, that's how I started. And I was making $17,000 a year. And with overtime and golden time, and I was putting in a lot of overtime, I was making $30,000 that first year um, and living at home. Um, while I was doing the job, uh, I was just, you know, I never called in sick because I was just so hungry to learn. So I actually told the, the, the manager, I said, listen, if anyone calls in sick, call me. Um, and I'll fill in just because I was so hungry to learn mm -hmm. and um, you know as a desk assistant what was my job I was like getting the coffee making the copies it's like an SNL skit mm -hmm. <laughs> I was making the coffee getting making the copies picking up the phones and I just remember the very first day of that job I just it was like the dream come true job you know I had been pursuing ABC, NBC, CBS for three for for five months after graduation from college, and they all called me back at the same time, five months into the search, and when I got this job at ABC, that was like the the you know that was the job that I wanted, and that first day on the job, I didn't know what my job would actually be. I just knew I was working at the company that I really wanted to work at. And you know, I walked in with the only suit that I own, which is not really a suit, and the only pair of high heels <laughs> that I ever wore up until that point. And uh, you know, there were two desk editors and me, and that was it in the whole newsroom. And so my job was getting the coffee, making the copies, picking up the phone, and I came home from that first day on the job completely demoralized because I had gone to a very good school, a co very good college, and um, doors were supposed to swing wide open for me after college. And I was basically looking at, at this job as I'm a glorified secretary. And I went to, I told my dad when I came home that first day, I was like, Appa, I can't, I can't do this job. And he's like, why? I said, because I'm a glorified secretary. I, w I didn't go to this college just to, be a secretary. I'm not. It's not journalism. And he said to me, you know, he he was he was like, you ha you 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 can't jump three rungs on a ladder. You have to lay your foundation brick by brick. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you have to be there for three years. And I'm like, <laughs> when you're 21 years old, three yeah, years sounds like time. freaking forever. <laughs> I was like, three years. But you know, my dad, you know, loves me. No, knows, you know, the best for you know ha wants the best for me. And he's like, no, you have to stay there for three years, and you have to lay your bricks down, and you have to learn, and you just, you know, you just learn and you work hard. And so, I did. I I, I did that for three years. Laid my bricks. I em eventually got kind of somewhat promoted within those three years. Uh, but that was it was a hard pill to swallow but what i learned from that was you know uh, you know i'm a person of faith too so i believe in god and i just said okay god i, I have to trust that this is the door that you open for me this was actually the answered prayer that i had been praying so let me not despise the job and even though it feels so menial let me do my utmost to 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 you know because that's what you've called me to do and so that's, that's what I did. And that, that um, mindset at that early age um, has been throughout my career and it has always served me well. Okay. Yeah. Sandra? Um, for me, I um, had always worked through college in my major. I was a criminal justice major. So um, I landed a paid internship while I was in college. Um, when 9-11 happened, it happened my senior year, mm -hmm. and it happened at the time where I had just put in a whole bunch of applications <laughs> with different uh, federal agencies, and I was proceeding to move on to the next phase, and then 9-11 happened and everything stopped because you had to have a certain major, they, was, they were looking for certain language skills, mm -hmm. and I didn't have that. And uh, where I was interning that, I t took a full-time posi position there. 
and it was not what I wanted to do. I complained to my mother and I complained to my mother and she kept telling me, you may not want to do this, but this is something that you have to do for now to pay your bills, to pay your student loans. So I need you to suck it up, cry all you want to at home, mm -hmm. but eventually the crying is going to have to stop because this is not permanent, it's just temporary. And that was something that I had to keep in mind was that it was just temporary. And I took everything that I learned from that job and I applied somewhere else and moved, and, and moved on. And I would say, take all your skills, see what you have in common, and maybe if you can find that one job so that you can focus on going to that one job that, that meets your needs, while at the same time uh, it gives you the opportunity to do what it is that you want to do. But it's not gonna happen overnight. It's going to take time. Um, but you can't give up. And, and like she said, don't despise mm -hmm. where you're at. Don't put your mouth on it. Don't speak against it. Mm -hmm. Because when you do, you actually stop mind. yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you put yourself at a halt. Mm -hmm. And um, before I moved up here to New York, when I knew that I did all that I could do at the job that I had, I had before I came up here, uh, I would have different thoughts come to my head, like I can't do this anymore, this is not working, and I had to stop myself and replace those thoughts with, I'm grateful that I'm here today. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I, I got up today. You know, this may not be great, but I am able to do this, I am able to do this. Thank you, Lord, that you gave me this position, mm -hmm. that this is where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I had to turn, I had to, change my mind which was hard to do because my brain was like what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> what are you do you not see where you are like we don't want to be here anymore it's nothing more for you to do but i had to ignore that and just continue to speak it mm -hmm. and then when when i finally found myself settling down that's when the doors open up and they're open mm -hmm. and they definitely will um yeah. i'm a comedian so uh, that is that's that's been a crazy journey. Um, I worked full time. I quit my full time job. Then I had to go back to my full time job mm -hmm. part time. Um, I have worked for the circus. I have worked at a restaurant in the basement. I have been the person on the street trying to rent you a car for a zip car. I have worked uh, for Instacart. I have had every job in New York City. Okay, and I am a person with a degree from Florida A&M University. I have a degree in journalism. Um, and when I moved to New York, um, I had family, but they were not, you know, my strongest foundation. The day I ended up losing my internship, I had a nice little internship, and it was my last day. They was like, um, listen, we got bills to pay. I'm gonna need you <laughs> to pay some of these bills. I didn't have a job. Um, and I just kind of had to figure it out. Um, I've been here seven years. I've been here working two, three jobs. You know, you, you have to figure it out, right? But I've continued to do comedy shows. Um, I had one bad comedy show that definitely, uh, it was about as quiet as this room, right? And it definitely stopped me for about six months. And then I got back up and I said, no, wait a minute. I love doing this. Let me keep going. Um, so you just have to find your keep going, like what's going to keep you going. Work those three jobs and keep going because something's going to pop. I just did four commercials. Mm -hmm. So something's going to pop, right? Mm -hmm. But you, if you stop, nothing's happening. No. Mm -hmm. But if you keep going, you'll reach your point. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we are going to end here. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for coming out. Samir, Margaret Kim, Sandra Patterson. Um, I want to thank our audience for being here and participating. Um, and thank you all so much for being a part of the Shades of Diversity and Media um, panel. This has been such a great experience. I hope you all enjoyed it. My name is Courtney B. And have a great evening. Thank right. you.